Bibles, I'd like you to turn, please, to John chapter 16 this morning. In John chapter 16, we're going to see some words from Jesus Christ that I believe will encourage you today and challenge you. Here we're going to find that the disciples were saddened at this point. The disciples had a, a, a kind of a, a sorry a, a spirit, a sad spirit. They have just learned or they've just realized that Jesus Christ is going to leave them. Now Jesus Christ was telling them this his entire ministry. From the very early words of Jesus Christ, he told his followers, listen, I'm here for a while, but I'm going to have to leave you. I'm going to go away, and I'm going back to heaven where I'm going to sit at the right hand of God. For whatever reason, and we're all guilty of this, it hadn't quite sunk in until now. Now this happens to all of us where what we hear And what we understand sometimes doesn't happen in the same moment. We hear this is going to take place. For students, it's test day. Test day is next Friday. What they hear and what they understand, they they don't compute. And Monday passes and it's wonderful. Test day is Friday. Tuesday, life is grand. Wednesday, party day. Thursday, woo, Friday. Oh, no. It's test day. What they heard and what they understood and how they reacted didn't quite line up. It seems that has happened with the disciples. That they've known that Jesus has said he's going to leave, but now it's reality. Now he said, just a little bit longer and I'm going to be gone. And it's like they say, what? You can't leave yet. You can't go anywhere. The one who has walked with us. The one who has taught us. The one who has has performed miracles around us and through us. The one who has befriended us. The one who has used us to minister. The one who has explained spiritual concepts to us. The one who has been a friend and a teacher. The one who has done marvelous works. No, Jesus, you can't leave yet. Lord, you're not done here. We remember when, when you, you, you calmed the storm and the water. Lord, I'm sure you got some more miracles left. And so here the disciples, we come to this passage, and the disciples are feeling some sadness and sorrow because of some loss or a realized loss that will soon come. I find that in our life there are times that I and you can feel the same way. That we feel that Jesus Christ has left us and has left us alone. Now the Bible says that Jesus has not done that. In fact, he says that I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But in our mind, in our life, in our heart, we work through this, Lord, I'm kind of lonely right now. Lord, I'm handling all of these struggles, all of these battles, all by myself. No one else understands. No one else can relate. No one else can can give any kind of weight to what I'm going through. Lord, why have you left me alone? Lord, why have you left me to fend for myself? And here in John chapter 16, we're going to read some verses. We're going to discover that Jesus Christ not only did not leave us alone, did not leave the disciples alone, but has promised that once he went to heaven, which he did just a few chapters later in the book of Acts, that when he went to heaven, he would leave behind the Holy Spirit who would help us, who would encourage us and enable us. Today I want to speak on the incredible gift that God has left to us. If you have your Bibles, please, John chapter 16, beginning in verse number 1. Where Jesus says these things to his disciples, These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come ye may remember that I had told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me whither goest thou. 
But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me, because I go to the Father." Let's ask the Lord's blessing on this time of the service, if you would, please. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that we can have this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that during this service that you would touch us through your word. That the Holy Spirit would convince us and convict us of sin, of error. And Lord, those who... This morning, need to put their faith in you. I pray that they would trust you for salvation today. And Lord, we ask that you would be glorified, that Jesus would be uplifted, that everything that's done here would please you. Lord, we love you. We praise you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus left, Jesus did not say, now listen, I'm going to go to heaven, but you can FaceTime me. Now, I'm thankful for his FaceTime because it enables me to see someone who's not nearby. But Jesus did not leave us with FaceTime. He did not leave us with WhatsApp video calls, though I'm thankful for WhatsApp video calls. They help us know someone and see someone who's in another country who maybe can't do FaceTime. When Jesus left us, he did not say, now, I don't have FaceTime, I don't have have WhatsApp, but I do have Marco Polo. And I'll leave you a video. No, Jesus did not leave us with a phone call, with a video call, with a telegram. Jesus said this. Jesus said, when I leave, I'm going to leave someone else who will help you, who will enable you, who will guide you, who will instruct you. And Jesus in this passage is clearly telling us that he has not left his children alone. Now, I'm thankful he has not done that. I'm thankful he's given us someone to help and to encourage because there are days, listen, when life is tough and I'm thankful the Holy Spirit is there to help me and help you. I'm glad that when I go to a funeral home and I'm talking to a mom and a dad who, has lost a, who have lost a child, I can say, here, listen, I don't know how you feel, but the Holy Spirit does and he will encourage you. I'm thankful I can go to a, to a mom who's struggling with a relationship with a daughter and say, listen, the Holy Spirit can comfort and help you. I can go to a dad and say, listen, your dad is struggling and the Holy Spirit will help you. I can go to a man who's lost his job and say the Holy Spirit can help you and encourage you and comfort you. I'm thankful that God left us the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said a few things in this passage that I think are pertinent to the conversation. Jesus, first of all, gave us the reason for the Holy Spirit. Two reasons in this passage we find. Number one, he said, listen, you need the Holy Spirit because, number one, I'm not going to be there in the same way. Jesus, with these disciples, had walked among them. In fact, John, in the book of 1 John, says that our hands have handled of the word of life. Jesus was physically present on earth. That is a truth I hold to because the Bible says it, I believe it, and God says it's true. And Jesus was physically on earth. And the first reason we have the Holy Spirit is because because Jesus said, you know what? I won't be among you the same way that I was. You see, when Jesus walked on earth, the woman who struggled with a problem in life could touch the hem of his garment. We can't touch him the same way. The first reason that we have the Holy Spirit is because Jesus left. Jesus said, if I don't leave, I won't leave the Holy Spirit. But he had to leave. But the other reason is more disconcerting, if I can. It's a little more weighty. The other reason we have the Holy Spirit is because Jesus said, there's going to be trouble. And boy, isn't that the understatement of the century? 
There's going to be trouble. You know, we've had, we'll have a, in a few weeks a praise service at First Baptist Church. We've never had a trouble service at First Baptist Church. Right? Where everyone come to the microphone and share your troubles. Now we often have trouble conversations at First Baptist Church. All right, let me share what's going on. And even sometimes it may even uh, uh, go to the complaining realm. But, but what if we had a trouble service? Let me tell you how bad life's going to be today, folks. I'm not here to encourage you. I'm here to discourage you. It's going to be bad out there. And, and, and before you think it's, it's going to be terrible, they're going to throw you out of the public sphere. They're, they're, they're going to try to kill you out there. You'll be like, well, pastor, it's not a very helpful message. Understand Jesus starts the conversation, and that's what he's saying. There's going to be opposition out there, and it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be lovely. It's going to be personal. It's going to be physical. It's going to be pointed. There's going to be opposition in your life. And my friends, not everything in the Christian life is smooth sailing. There are those, even some on television, who will tell you that, listen, once you become a Christian, life is just all, all up, it's beautiful. My friends, sometimes... Sometimes, as a Christian, life stinks. Just ask Job in the Bible. Boy, if Job was alive, some TV evangelist would tell him, boy, you just don't have enough faith, Job. And we could say from the Scripture, no, God says that Job was the most righteous individual in the entire earth. And Jesus says to his disciples, and he says to us, listen, there is going to be trouble now, before you, before you check out on me, before you say, Pastor, that's not why I came to church. Jesus didn't stop the conversation there. But it is clear, there's going to be trouble. And what happens in our life when we hit trouble, we act surprised. What? Why is there opposition? Jesus said there is going to be opposition. Another place he said, listen, don't be surprised when they hate you. They hated me first. The devil does not want you to succeed or the truth of God to succeed. He will do everything he can to encourage those to discourage the children of God. There will be opposition. There will be rejection. In fact, verse number one says that ye should not be, the last word of there is offended. Or you should not be trapped or ensnared. Understand in just a few chapters away that these disciples on a real level, will be offended for Jesus Christ. They will come to arrest Jesus and every single disciple of whom Jesus just said, listen, don't be offended for me. They will all flee. And Peter, the most famous offender in this conversation, will look at a young maid and, and take an oath saying, I don't even know Jesus. Jesus said, listen, there's opposition not only external, but there's opposition internal. Not only is there problems outside, there's problems inside. My heart doesn't always want to follow Jesus Christ. My spirit doesn't always want to follow Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is saying, listen, the reason you need the Holy Spirit is there's confusion, there's offenses, there's opposition, but you don't have to have sorrow. You don't have to be sad. Look at verse number six. Sorrow has filled your heart. My friend, if you're a Christian and sorrow has filled your heart, then you've missed the gift of the Holy Spirit because Jesus is saying, listen, there's going to be problems outside and inside. But you don't have to let these, these opposition, these troubles, affect your spirit. And you don't have to let it affect you, not because you're really tough. Not because you have some, some deep character and inner strength. I don't know about you, but there's times that I'm sick of social media Christian memes. Now, I, I look at some of them just because, and I shouldn't because it just, they, I mean, they, they, can, they can get me. Like the, the one that says that God saves his toughest battles for his strongest servants I'm sorry. Every battle God sends is above my capacity. All right, because Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And listen, I don't have to have sorrow in my heart because Jesus said, I'm going to leave someone else to help you. We call him the Holy Spirit. In this passage, there are two names that are used. 
for the Holy Spirit. Look at verse number seven. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Can I just stop? Paul's right there. Jesus Christ always tells the truth. He always says what is true. He never says a lie. Anything he says is true and will be true and will always be true. He goes, I'm going to tell you the truth. It is expedient. It is good. It is helpful that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. That word comforter, uh, we, we see it. In a few other passages, we see it in John chapter 14. We'll see this word comforter twice in John chapter 14, once in John chapter 15, and here in John chapter 16. It it means one who, who comforts and one who helps. The word there is a paraclete, one who helps. I heard a man talking about this once, and I loved what he said. He said, you may not know what a paraclete is, But you may know what a parachute is. And he said, when you're falling from the sky, a parachute opens up above you and carries you all the way down to the ground. And this man said, listen, the Holy Spirit, when you're falling in life and you're about to hit the ground and your life's about to be over, the paraclete becomes a parachute and he keeps you from wrecking your life. I'm glad that my paraclete is a parachute in life. There are times that I feel like I'm just falling aimlessly and the Holy Spirit graciously comforts and helps. We're on that path and the Holy Spirit helps us. This man went on to say, listen, you may not know what a paraclete is, but maybe you know what a paramedic is. And when you're hurt and when your body's broken, And when you're bloodied and bruised and battered, a paramedic steps in and he helps heal your body and he fixes the hurt in your life. And and this man said, listen, I'm so glad that my paraclete becomes a paramedic that when I'm broken and when you're broken, when I'm bruised in my spirit, when I'm bruised spiritually in life, that the paramedic of the Holy Spirit comes and he heals and he mends and he comforts my life. I'm so glad he shows up at funerals to comfort. I'm so glad he shows up in the unemployment line. I'm so glad he shows up late at night when I'm lying in bed all alone and the paramedic helps heal a broken heart or broken spirit. I'm glad he shows up in the broken marriages, broken relationships. I'm glad he shows up when I'm broken on the inside. My paraclete is a paramedic. And this man wanted to say this, you may not know what a paraclete means, but you've maybe heard of a paraphrase. And someone takes what you're saying and says it a little bit differently. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit, and we don't know how we ought to pray, that there is one who prays for us. When we don't know what to say, that the comforter, the paraclete, begins to paraphrase for us to the Father. And our Holy Spirit, the Comforter, helps us with groanings, the Bible says, that cannot be uttered. My friends, there are days in our life because of opposition, because of hurt, because of struggle, that I don't know how to pray. Just being honest, I don't know how to pray. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit helps me to pray when I don't know how to pray. And maybe you've been there before. You sit there and you feel lost. Like, Lord, just help me know how to pray. What even do I begin to pray for in this situation? What even do I do? And Jesus says, it is expedient. It is good that I leave. Because when the trouble comes, I will leave you the comforter. The paraclete. Not only is he a comforter, but the Bible says in verse number 13, there's another name used. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Not only is he a comforter, but he is a guide. The Bible says here he reproves, he guides in three ways. He reproves the world of sin, he reproves the world of righteousness, and he reproves the world of judgment. What that means is that when he reproves the world of sin, that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin in our life. That means that before I'm saved, he begins to show that I'm not a good person, that I'm a bad person because of sin. 
that I don't make the right choices, that I've done things God has said not to do. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He convinces and convicts of sin. After I've trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, he again convinces and convicts that sometimes I still make sinful choices. There are some times that I have a rotten, no good, bad attitude. And the Holy Spirit says, you've got a rotten, no good, bad attitude. But sometimes I make a choice that doesn't honor the Lord. And the Holy Spirit says, you've made a choice that doesn't honor the Lord. This is the job of the Holy Spirit. He convicts the world of sin. He convinces of righteousness. Well, this is what you ought to do. He convinces that Jesus is alive and real and that he cares. He convinces that his way is the right way. He convinces that following God's word is the correct path and that he reproves of judgment or he persuades that all that we know will happen from God's word. I'm so thankful that we have the Holy Spirit. But now this morning as we conclude the service, I want to challenge us. Because Jesus said, if I leave, the Comforter will come. As we read our Bible, we find out in the book of Acts early on that these disciples, these same disciples who heard this, are sitting in an upper room. They're praying, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit at that point begins to work on earth. They go out there, and they begin to prophesy and testify. They begin to preach, and God uses them in a mighty way. But God still has the Holy Spirit available for you and for me. But this morning, I want to talk briefly about what your response to the Holy Spirit is. Well, I'm thankful, as you should be. I'm grateful, as we should be. But I believe there are two from this passage, two responses that we ought to have because of what Jesus Christ has said. The first response I think we find in verse 13. When Jesus said, the Holy, how be it, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Number one, the first response that you and I must have is we must allow ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would not speak of himself. He will speak of the word of Jesus. What that means is that the Holy Spirit will use the word of God in your life and in my life to convict us of sin to convince us of righteousness and how to live righteously and with discernment and judgment. And instead of resisting the Lord, we ought to accept his leading in our life. There was a famous preacher by the name of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was a, was a fantastic speaker, and God used him greatly. There was one time he was holding a revival service, and another man said, why do we need D.L. Moody at the service? And another preacher said, or the man said, why do we need him? He's uneducated and inexperienced. Does he think that he has a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? Could we not use someone else? And this other preacher said to this man, he said, listen. He said, no, D.L. Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. But he said, the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. D.L. Moody. And in your life and in my life, I want the Holy Spirit who Jesus promised in John chapter 16, who would do these things and fill this need in my life. I want him to have a monopoly on my life and on your life. Now, Baptists get afraid of the Holy Spirit. Our Pentecostal friends, perhaps, uh, not perhaps, do go a little bit too far in the Holy Spirit, but Baptists get afraid of the Holy Spirit. He can't speak to us. Jesus said, when I give you the comforter, he will guide you. And so my job is to allow him to guide me. Right? If Jesus said he'll guide you, my job let him to, to, to let him guide me. They say, all right, Holy Spirit, I need your guidance. Allow him to be guided, a guide in my life. When I was younger, 10th grade, I realized that I could not see the blackboard correctly. So my parents took me to an eye doctor. And I looked at the chart, and apparently I failed the chart. And they gave me some glasses. There's a 10th grade boy. I had the nerdiest glasses you could possibly imagine. There are pictures floating around of which we hopefully will never see here at First Baptist Church. Now all of you are like, hey, can we get our hands on those pictures? There's opposition in life, sometimes outwardly. But those glasses enabled me to clearly see what I couldn't see before. 
I couldn't be guided by the instruction before because my eyesight was hindered. And the glasses allowed me to see. The Holy Spirit lets me see these things. He guides me. I remember when I got those glasses, I'd be driving down the road. Or not driving, I'd be riding down the road. And I would play this game, when can I see the sign? And maybe if you've gotten glasses later in life, you've played, the sign, when, or played this game, when can you see the sign, right? So you see a sign down the road, it's blurry. And then you're like, the person next to you, when can you see it, when can you see it? Now I can see it. And then with glasses, I, I, I did it with myself. Like, and I realized before the glasses how little I could perceive the world. How everything was, was all blurry. My friends, before the truth from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, there is little that we can perceive in this world. In fact, the Bible says in Corinthians that there are things we won't understand because they're spiritually discerned, they're spiritually seen. This is the guide of the Holy Spirit. And it's my job to allow Him to guide me. You see, the reason you aren't guided by the Holy Spirit is not that He's not speaking, it's that you're not listening. You've drowned him out by your own thoughts, by your own logic. You make your own decisions. So why do you need a guide in your life? You just do what you want to do anyway. So you don't ask the Holy Spirit and the Lord for help. You just do your own thing. And sometimes we're not guided because we just ignore him. Or you have your mind occupied with something else, with vileness or bitterness or anger or your own fear or panic. And the Holy Spirit wants to guide. Jesus said he will guide but you filled your mind with everything else, with the garbage, with the filth, and you wonder why the Holy Spirit is not active in your life because you have pushed him right out. You've let the filthy music from this world fill your mind all day long. As soon as you get in that car, you turn on your Apple Music, you turn on that uh, uh, Sirius XM, and the rest of the day you're listening to the world all day long, and you wonder why there's no guidance, why you can't see clearly. Because you've pushed out the great God named the Holy Spirit. I must allow myself to be guided. But number two, I must allow Christ to be glorified. Jesus says, not only allow yourself to be guided, but allow me to be glorified. See, the Holy, Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, he will not speak of himself and glorify himself. He will glorify me. You see, when the Holy Spirit gets involved in your life and my life, we find out that it's not about me it's about Jesus. You see, the reason we don't see Christ glorified is because you're too busy glorifying yourself. You're showing everybody else how good you are, how smart you are. The reason, because, the reason you don't see amazing answers to prayer is because you leave nothing for God to do. You answer your own prayer requests. I have this need, I work overtime. I have this problem, I'll fix it. There's no room for Jesus to be glorified you don't even need the Holy Spirit. You don't need Jesus. You solve it yourself. The reason you don't see others turn toward Jesus Christ is because all they see is you. Busy solving your own problems, you work overtime. Let me bring it down one more level for us. Make it real plain and real simple this morning. Two little phrases and we'll be done this morning. Can I sum it up this way? Number one, get in the way. Get in the way. The Bible says there's a, there's a servant. And the servant said, I being in the way, the Lord led me. And you're in my job is to get in the way of God. Allow him to show me his way. I must get in the way. And then, number two, I must get out of the way. Get in the way and get out of the way. I must get in the way so he can speak to me and get out of the way for him to work. That's the proper response to the Holy Spirit. Some of you need to get in the way this morning. For some of you, God's been touching your heart about being saved and asking God to forgive your sins. Get in the way. All right, listen to the, to the Holy Spirit in your life. Get in the way and let him save you and get out the way. Some of you need to respond to the Lord in baptism. Right? What happens after salvation, we show everyone else that we're saved, we get baptized. Get in the way. Allow him to speak to you and convince you and convict you and then get out of the way and let Jesus work through you. Some of you need, need to get in the way of, and get serious about the word of God. So get in the way and then let God work and get out of the way. 
Some of you, it's about time you join the church and get involved. Get in the way, then get out of the way. Some of you need to let go of your bitterness and anger. Get in the way. Let Holy Spirit speak to you, and then get out of the way and let him work. You see, my job is to get in the way and get out of the way. I use this last story by permission. It involves someone here at First Baptist Church, and I asked them this morning, can I use this? Kind of story fit right in there, and they said yes. So understand, if you normally tell me these things, I will not just blanketly use you as an illustration at First Baptist Church. Unless your last name is Howell. Then it's all free. If your pastor's family, like anything you said, anything you do and say can and will be used against you in the next sermon. This was not, this is a, a good man in this church. This past week I called him and I said, hey, we we're just talking about a conversation. I said, hey, I said, uh, there's a ministry I think you ought, that maybe you ought to pray about being, being a part of, or would you consider this? This man, a good man in this church, began to chuckle. And I said something along the lines of, hey, there's obviously a little story here. Well, what's going on? He said, you won't believe it, but at lunchtime today, my wife and I were sitting there at the table. We were just talking about how, you know what, we got to get involved a little more at First Baptist Church. we got to add another ministry. He said, and then you called just maybe a couple hours later. You know what that is? That's someone getting in the way and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit said, hey, you know what? You need to be a little more involved at, at church. They're like, that's what I need to do. And then, to be honest, on my end, in the way, when I called them, I believe I ought to say something about this. Now on the back end, we see the Holy Spirit just working just like this. And you know who gets the glory? Oh, not the pastor. No, 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 no. Not this man and his wife who, who love God and try to follow God, but Jesus gets the glory. You see, we must get in the way and then get out of the way. And this morning, maybe it's about time you, for some of you to get back in the way. Maybe the Holy Spirit has been trying to convince you and convict you of something. It's about time you said, yes, Lord, I'll do that. I'll accept your gift of salvation, Lord. I'll take the next step spiritually. Lord, I need to get my finances structured for you. I don't know what that step will be, but maybe it's about time you got in the way. Then maybe it's about time to get out of the way and let Jesus Christ just be glorified in you. So when others see you, they don't see, they don't see you. They see Jesus Christ. At our house, we have these lights. They're in our front. Uh, uh, can't even think what I'm trying to say here. Our, in front of our house or in the, uh, I'm what I'm trying to say, honey. The walkway, by the walkway, there's about 10, 12 of them. And these lights all point toward the house. And at night, if you drive past our house, you notice the house is lit up. You don't notice the lights. And that's the point of my life and your life, is for someone not to notice the light, but to see Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, let your light so shine before men. Let that light shine. Not so they see the light and say, well, that's a beautiful light. That's a well-formed light. That's a, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty good light. But so they see your Father, which is in heaven. My friend, this morning, get in the way and get out of the way.